So right now, hey, let's open our Bibles and let's go to our scripture reading here this morning. We're going to go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, and I am going to read the final four verses of that chapter. Romans chapter 11, starting with verse number 33. And hopefully you brought your Bibles with you. If you don't, we have few Bibles that you can look at. I'm going to be reading out of a, an NASB Bible. And if you have your place in your Bibles, let me hear you say amen. amen. Let's stand while God's word is being read here this morning, starting with verse number 33. And this is the doxology that Paul gives here in the book of Romans. He says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. I've titled today's message, God's Breaking Point. And this is just another in, this, in a series that I have titled, Christianity in Troubled Times. Would we not all agree that we are living in kind of some troubled times, amen? These are troubled times. When you were growing up as a child, how much patience, God bless you, how much patience did your mother or father have with you when you misbehaved? And all of you know the answer to that. What was their breaking point? When did they say to you, enough is enough? And then take some kind of disciplinary action. For me personally, it was obvious that my father was the discipl disciplinarian in our family. I could get away with a lot with my mother, but my father had some patience, but you really did not want to push that envelope very far. Because if you pushed it too far, there would be a price to pay because you would drive him to his breaking point. One day, when I was a senior in high school, I pushed that envelope a little too far. Am I gonna tell you what I did? No way. <laughs> I had to suffer the consequences of my actions and the consequences for me were this. As a senior in high school, he took my driver's license away from me for one month. And taking your driver's license away when you're a senior in high school is a really big deal. And that was tough. That was really tough for me. I learned a valuable lesson from that whole experience. And the lesson for me was this. Don't ever get caught again. <laughs> Does God ever get to his breaking point when he says enough is enough? And if so, how and when does that happen? How far, here's the question we're going to ask here this morning. How far can an individual, how far can a church, how far can a nation push that envelope before God enforces his discipline and he arrives at his breaking point. We know this, Psalm 103 verse eight, I had this up here last week. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in loving kindness. Even though that is a true statement, there comes a time when his compassion and his grace reaches its breaking point and his anger will rest no longer. This morning I want to give four 
instances from God's word where God's breaking point was reached. Let's look at what evil was done, who did the evil, and what God's consequences were for that particular event. Example number one. Let's talk about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel began, as you remember from Bible history, when God called Abram out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. We can read about that. And Abram was the father of God's own nation of Israel. And that was around, if you want to do some math, that was around 2000 BC, okay? About 4,000 years ago. Later on, after the exodus out of Egypt, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and now we're around 1,440 years BC. So between that time, 1440 BC, and around 739 BC, which is about 700 years, the nation Israel had settled into the Promised Land, and during that time they had judges, and they had some kings. Some of these people were good people, and some of these people were bad people. And during that time, the nation of Israel actually split into two. It split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom, which they called Judea. The northern kingdom was 10 tribes. The southern kingdom, just two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. So what made God reach his breaking point with Israel 700 years after they were in the promised land? We talked about this a little bit last week. I'm going to bring it back up again. Isaiah, I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. From Isaiah 66.4. And then we go down to Chronicles 36, 12. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Who's the he that they're talking about? King Zedekiah, Lord his God. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. Last Sunday, I delivered a message from Isaiah 5 about how God had spoken through the prophets the major prophets, the minor prophets, spoke through the prophet Isaiah in particular, and he pronounced four woes on the nation of Israel. God's own people, the nation Israel, were being warned that their continued evil behavior would result in divine consequences. So what were the consequences of 700 years of doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, there were two punishments, one to the northern kingdom and the other to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel was exiled to Assyria in 722 BC. You can read about that in 2 Kings. And the southern kingdom of Judea was exiled about 150 years later to Babylon in 575 BC. I'm going to put a chart up here. So who was it? It was Israel. What was the evil that they committed? Well, the Bible tells us this. They just did evil in the sight of the Lord, and that could encompass a lot of different things. What's the time frame? Over 700 years of doing this. And God, what was God's breaking point? What was the consequence? The people were exiled to a foreign, to a pagan country. So that's example number one. 700 years it took for God's wrath to be stored up and it reaches breaking point. Example number two comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11. King David, we're all aware and know about King David. King David finds himself acting more like a man than a man of God. It begins with lust over a woman and her name was Bathsheba. And that lust turned into coveting. And that coveting turned into adultery. And we can read about that in 2 Samuel 
11, verse 4. I believe I have that up here. So how did David get into trouble? Well, let's look to see what he did here. 2 Samuel 11, 4. David sent messengers and took her, Bathsheba, and when she came to him, he lay with her. Okay, then what else did he do? 2 Samuel eleven fifteen. He had written in the letter saying, place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So how did he get from here to here? Well, uh, okay, David, you might have had some good times there, buddy. But it turns sour real fast when David finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant with his child. So what does he do? He has her husband, Uriah, put on the front lines and then killed. So let's just end this whole thing with murder. So what made God reach his breaking point with King David? Well, it's pretty obvious. He was approached by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 11, 26, 27. Now, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But, great transition word, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of God the Lord. It was evil in the sight of the Lord. So what were the consequences? David actually had two different consequences that the Lord put on him. Number one from verse, chapter 12, verse 10. Now therefore, this is Nathan speaking to David. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Why? Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And if that wasn't bad enough, we know that they had a child. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. So you have a couple punishments. God's anger reached his breaking point and he had to deal with David. So what do we have? Who did it? King David? Lust, coveting, adultery, and murder. Over the time frame, if you really look at it, this probably happened over about a few months, maybe two, three months. God's breaking point, what was the consequence? He said, the sword will never depart your house, David. And the child died. You might be thinking right, right about now that, come on, this punishment was a little harsh. Come on, God, this was a little harsh. People lust and people covet and people have affairs all the time. True, they do. But you and I are not the determiners of God's breaking point and how and when and to whom he carries out his justice. Actually, the only reason it doesn't happen to all the people who do what King David did is because God is also merciful okay so we have two examples let's go to example number three we're gonna have four of these total there's an interesting story back in the book of second samuel about a man named Uzza, u-z-z-a-h this man was at the wrong place at the wrong time with the right intentions in the book of numbers chapter 4 verse 15 it says this, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come and carry them, underlined in bold, so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. Now, let me give you a quick explanation. Everything that was part of the, the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, had to be carried in a certain way. The Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments were contained, was never to be touched. Instead, it was always to be carried with poles. On the side of the Ark, there were rings 
poles were supposed to be inserted into those rings, and that's how the ark was to be carried. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, King David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem because the Philistines had stolen it. It was on a cart being pulled by some oxen. The oxen stumbled and nearly upset the cart. And Uzzah sees what's about to happen. He only wants to protect the Ark so he reaches out to try to keep it from falling. He had the right intentions. What does it say? But when they came to the threshing floor at Nakan, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. It's probably what any of us would have done. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down, therefore his irreverence, and he died there by the Ark of the Covenant. So what were the consequences? The guy was just trying to keep the Ark from falling out of the cart. And God said, don't touch the Ark. Don't touch the Ark. Uzzah, you touched the ark. And Uzzah died on the spot. One conclusion, there's many conclusions we can arrive at from this story, but one conclusion I want to point out is this. That there can be people who can do disobedient things all with what they think are the right intentions but their disobedience may or will result in God's consequences. Because wrong is still wrong, and right is still right. So now, let's, we've got three things on our chart. Who did the evil? Uzzah, he touched the ark. What was the time frame? Oh, immediate, happened right there on the spot. And what was the consequence? It was death. Now. I know what you're thinking about this episode, too, because you're thinking probably the same thing I am. That wasn't fair. That wasn't fair. I'm sure there were other people who touched the ark, and they never died. First of all, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God has to be fair. Okay? Nowhere will you find that attribute of God. And second, who am I? Or who are you to tell God what is and what is not fair? God makes the rules, and God determines the discipline. Do we really want fair? Because if we really want fair, we would all be going to hell. That's fair. One final example. Genesis 6, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creepy things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. It looks like God is coming to his breaking point with all of mankind. Did you know that if you go back into the earlier books of Genesis 1 through 5 and you do the math, that the flood began exactly 1,656 years after Adam was created. Okay? 1,656 years. That's a long time. That is long suffering. 
So what made God reach his breaking point? Well, there it is, bold and underlined, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what was the consequence? I think we all know what the consequence was. So let's look and see what the scriptures say. Genesis 7, 21 through 23. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts, and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. And we know who those people were, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, eight people. Let's look at the final line item here on our chart. Who committed the evil? Everybody, everybody, mankind. And what did they commit? The evil intent of their hearts continually. What was the time frame for, for God's breaking point? Well, he was very slow to anger here. 1,656 years to be exact. And what was the consequence? He destroyed all mankind except for eight very fortunate people. Folks, these are just four examples of when the long suffering of God reaches its breaking point. Sometimes it's centuries, as you can see on the chart. And sometimes it can be immediate. It appears God does not follow any kind of formula for his time of judgment and for invoking his discipline. He doesn't have to. And that's why I read the scripture from Romans here a little bit earlier. I'll just point out one verse. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor. We know this. We know that God judges. And we know that his judgments are always righteous. And we know that his consequences are always on time, no matter if they are immediate or if they're over a period of centuries. I spoke all this to lead up to just a few final words here and then what we're going to talk about the next couple weeks. Beach Grove, I'm going to tell you something you already know. The United States of America has strayed far from the word of God. Amen. Now the question that we need to ask is this. Is God at his breaking point for our nation? Is God maybe at his breaking point for the church? Could God be at his breaking point for me as an individual or for you as an individual? Evil will have its consequences. God's judgment will happen. Maybe sooner, and it may be later. But it will happen because it must happen. That is God's nature. Is God's judgment what we are seeing in the United States of America today? Good question. One last scripture verse that I want to put up here. It's actually, it's on the front of your bulletin. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And now, what I believe is one of the most terrifying verses in the word of God. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
this country no longer has a fear of the Lord. And they better. We better. Why? Because it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Come back next week as we're going to look closer to the word of God and we're going to look more at the condition of our country as if you don't know what that is. We're going to look at the good if, if we can find any. We're going to look at the bad. Well, you could already do that. Just turn on TV, turn on the news. And we're going to look at what happens when things get ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's not pretty, my friends. It's not going to be pretty. But let's look at what the Word of God says, and then we'll go from there.